Hi, everyone. I hope you had great lunch. Uh, my name is Vanya Ftimova Ballinger, and I'm your moderator and MC for the afternoon session on uh, women, peace, and security and curriculum development. I'm a member of the strategy and policy department here at the Naval War College. Uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Joan uh, Johnson Fries, who is currently lecturing at Harvard Extension School, but until recently, uh, taught here at the uh, Naval War College. As a reminder, you can find the presenter's full biographies in the virtual program accessible through the posted QR codes, that thing. And they're all fantastic um, presenters, so I, I encourage you to do this. Uh, the presentations will last about um, 20 minutes after each. Uh, after each, I will open the floor for questions. So, Dr. Johnson, please. Well, thank you, Vanya. Thank you to the Naval War College for inviting me back. Um, it's nice to see my former colleagues here and to have the opportunity to talk about uh, women, peace and security, teaching women, peace and security. And this is going to be done based on eight years of teaching two classes a year through Harvard Extension and summer schools um, under a full in-person format through a full Zoom format through a hybrid in-person and Zoom format, and then variations of the course curriculum in different venues, including uh, security cooperation, two-week courses, three-day cor three courses, um, one-hour drinking through a fire hose type courses, and a variety of others. So what I'm going to give you is kind of what I've learned, best practices, what works, what really doesn't work, and challenges. Um, and I only have about six or seven slides, but they're kind of dense, so I'll try and go through them quickly. I have three learning objectives in the course, and I use them according to how much time I have. If I have uh, an hour or three hours, I try and get through number one, just understanding the relevance of gender equality to international relations and global security. And as we heard this morning in the polling that was done, there are some skeptics. There are those who just, we have to, it's a, it's a hurdle to get past that. And one of the key um, elements of getting past that we have found repeatedly is data, data, data. And very often it's data that's very difficult to get. Um, so it, it's like uh, for many years in teaching PME, I would say, well, how do we show the value of PME? Well, that's a tough question to answer. So metrics, everybody wants metrics to show the value. Um, but again, it's a problem. One of the things we can do, and I, I stress over and over in the course, is whenever there's an opportunity to get gender aggregated, disaggregated data, get it. If I have more time, I try to get to a working knowledge of the needs for primary components of and implementation challenges of the WPS framework. I call it a framework. Most people call it an agenda because I've had too many people say agenda. So there's something hidden in it. What are you trying to do? It's nothing nefarious. It's just, again, we had a presentation this morning, language matters. So I just take agenda out to make it easier. And third, and this is, I think, the one that is actually very critical for military students is being able to generate gender and foreign policies and crises response, but that takes time. It's nothing you can do in an hour, it's nothing you can do in three hours, and it's certainly nothing you can do online on your computer while you're actually doing something else. Um, challenges, the title, the course I teach is called Women, Peace and Security, and inherently people think it's a gender studies course. I jump on soapboxes saying this is a government course, it's an international relations course, it's a security course, but until very recently, the component, the class component was 90% 90, 90 women, 10% men. That's jumped a little bit recently, we're up to about 30%, but that's I think largely because it is perceived as a gender studies course. There are courses, by the way, international relations through a feminist lens. Some universities will offer those. Too often, they are through gender studies programs, which further makes it difficult to see these connections. There is friction and resistance. 
Um, friction, of course, happens when something new is introduced and can usually be addressed through structural adjustments. Resistance is just, I don't buy it. And that's hard to get over. And again, data seems to be um, where we're at. I had a student recently say, you know, I resent it that we have to show data to show the importance of gender. And I said, I feel your pain, but that's where we are. So we need to, we need to get over that and just do it. Performative allyship. We hear there's a huge gap between policies, talk, and action. There is a big gap between policies, talk, and budget. If you believe that people prioritize, if you can look at a budget and see what people prioritize, well, the Women, Peace, and Security budget is um, still in the realm of what I consider coffee money from the Pentagon. WPS is seen as a nice thing to do, but not imperative. So the good thing is, I have found from students over eight years in countless different, different venues, once you can see the connection between gender and stability, you can't unsee it. And once you get there, it's no longer just a nice thing to do. It's imperative. Um, I said, usually I start off to audiences when I'm trying to convince them of this by saying something to the effect of in Afghanistan, where men pay bride prices to basically buy their, their bride. Um, it was found after a considerable amount of time that when bride prices went up, Taliban recruiting went up as well. They were able to recruit. That means paying attention to gender can tell you something about what's going on in the country. It's not just a nice thing to do. It adds to the potential for your strategy success. And um, forgotten in favor of real politic. And I think I'm gonna to come to in just a minute something that I've recently come across that I think addresses that. So this is the outline of my course. It covers the topics we go through. I would argue that the first three are essential. I could do that or I have done that in three to five hours. The first five allow you to really have a working knowledge of women, peace, and security. This morning, I heard lots of concepts being said that unless you understand them, are meaninglessness. Um, intersectionality, even gender. You need to understand the concepts before the, the details can really be gotten into in any meaningful way. It also covers the three pillars. Uh, it gets into how are they relevant in areas like China. Um, uh, one of the things I, I forgot to put on the slide, but as part of number two, dealing with masculinities, um, absolutely essential. Once we get through the first five, then we can go into specifics, showing examples. But without that contextual knowledge, you are still dealing with issues as ad hoc separate events. Um, as you'll notice, I don't get to women in the military until nine. And that's because I, I want the students to understand the context of what they're talking about. Otherwise you're talking about things like um, physical requirements. And that's not really a women, peace and security talk per se, it's an element within just as DEI is. So this is what we go through. We do have a tabletop exercise that is critical. Uh, I, we've run it only twice, once as a beta test and once in the class. For the beta test, one thing we found was we ran it in two, two parts. The first was to have an environmental crisis and divide students into groups to deal with it. And they did very well. And then we inserted an element of um, hard security. We had terrorists attack a nuclear power plant. And what we found, all the gender stuff went right out the window. Um, and that has raised some questions to me that I've been exploring and with my military students because I don't have a military background. And we've come up with, or they've come up with um, some interesting considerations that I'll, I'll get to in a minute. The second time we ran it with the students, it, one of the most interesting things was, and I have two people who are in, in my currently in my class here. So if you want to hear the student perspective, they can speak to them. 
was after about 10 minutes, one of the military students in the room said, can we talk to each other? And the answer was, yes, we expect that. And once that got going, uh, that's why we ran out of time. They were all talking to each other so much. It got great. Curricular material, there's a ton of it. And I certainly don't expect anybody to even be able to read those, but it is available. Um, the problem that I found immediately when I started teaching this course, they are all excellent. Most of them are edited volumes. Without context, they aren't as effective as they need to be. So I wrote a textbook. I wrote Women, Peace, and Security 101. And that's what I use as the primary text in the class. And I'm very pleased and honored to say that it's been so successfully used that I've been asked to do a second edition and the second edition will be out in January of 24. And it's much better uh, because I learned so much from the students that I work with and, and others. Um, it's, it, there's, this is a huge field and uh, people specialize. One of the things I'm very pleased to hear that the Naval War College is making their the book that will come out of this available online. The bottom bullet there is Women on the Frontiers of Peace and Security. It's from NDU Press in 2014, but it's really good four page articles from practitioners that that's available and students can read it. And we need more of that, but we also need context. Um, I have my students read both books by Valerie Hudson, uh, Sex and World Peace, and the Hillary, or, no, I have them read The First Political Order and, um, and the Hillary Doctrine. Excellent, but without context, again, they aren't as meaningful as they, they really could be. Um, I also use a variety of, of movies. And I highly, this is just a sample. And uh, these movies, most of them are by Fork Films, an organization Abigail Disney is behind. And I had a student tell me that the first night she was going to watch a movie, her husband was sitting there and she said, well, I'm going to watch this movie. I hope it won't bother you. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll read. And the next day he, he said, so when are we having movie night again? Um, they're very enjoyable and um educationally useful films. I also do guest speakers, but I'm really fussy about my guest speakers. I've been very fortunate. Uh, Mary Beth Leonard and Greta Holtz, the chancellor of NDU, have been excellent as women ambassadors who can talk about women in foreign policy, and they will talk candidly. Um, David Smith, of course, who has written about uh, the importance of men mentoring women and of allyship has talked to the class, Stephanie Foster, who's been with State Department. This semester in class, I had a panel of mostly gen eds, women gen eds talking, and it was great. It was really uh, very impressive. I got really smart last night at the reception. I've already committed Jane Stokes to teach to my summer class, to lecture to my summer class. Uh, this is Catherine Lucy, the founder of Solar Sisters, who talks about women in development and the importance of franchising for bringing up economics, which allows me to bring in the importance between gender economic or gender development, economics and stability. And just as an example of um, kind of the creativity and, the, and, and how the students get involved, uh, the top figure is a woman named Hanifa Nakayowa. She is an acid throwing survivor from Uganda. She speaks to my class every session. Uh, and one of the students, a French woman who's an interpreter at the Food and Agriculture Organization, did an entire series of chalk artwork, which she now has as part of a book um, talking about issues regarding gender violence. So there's many different ways that, again, this can the problem can be addressed. Best practices and to do. Um, I'm going to start with the upper, the graph in the upper corner. Probably about, um, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, Admiral Harley, then president of Naval War College, asked me to go through the curriculum of the three core departments and um, count how many of them were by women or co authored by women. And uh, there was a great variation between the departments. One department, as I remember it, had about 2%. The other one had about 
5% and one had about 7%. Um, nothing ever heard of that again. It kind of went away. But this year, one of the students in my, in my Women, Peace and Security class, who's here, John is here, did the same thing. He repeated it at the Joint Forces Staff College and came out with pretty much not much different. It's only two data points in two institutions, but I think it would do everybody, all institutions in PME, be a good thing to do to just look and see how many of your readings are at least have a co-author, a woman as a co-author. If you don't have women in your curriculum, it sends a message. It says they are not involved. So what works? Ground students in the basics, and this is where it can't just be online training. It can't be one lecture. It can't be disparate uh, training. It has to be. Um, it has to be a certain amount of education of the basics. We have to move beyond. Well, women, peace, and security. It's really only relevant for coin. We're in. We're in great power competition now. No, we have to just get past that. It is relevant across the board in many different ways. Um, stories, movies, art, guest speakers work, group exercises work, tabletop exercises. Um, one of my current students is here and said, I want to do that tabletop again. The first time I was just figuring out what I was doing. Now I want to do it. Now that I know what I'm doing, I want to do it again. To do. Okay, this is my wish list. Uh, we've heard a lot about what's going on at different organizations. Marine University is doing this, Naval War College is doing that. I think it would be a great service to everybody to have a primer on women, peace, and security that doesn't say how to teach it, but what needs to be included. Just are you talking about these various elements um, so that we're not, we're not all doing it differently? I also, again, think we should include more readings by women. Here's the, here's the one that's going to kind of probably get me booed off the stage. Um, integrating, mainstreaming women, peace and security is about leadership, but it's also about middle managers because they're the gatekeepers that keep women from getting into higher positions. And it's really the ground level people who are the future leaders. It's not about it's not about, you know, the 05s and 06s. It's about those coming through PME institutions. Nobody likes to teach what they don't understand. You ask me to teach fundamentals of flying a helicopter, and believe me, I am going to gloss over it as quickly as possible. So if you ask somebody who has no knowledge whatsoever of women, peace, and security to please integrate it into their curriculum, the same thing is going to happen. Military institutions um, project themselves as professional institutions, more like a business school or a law school, not, not a liberal arts institution. Well, accountants, lawyers, doctors, they all have to have continuing education. So if I had my way, I would require all PME faculty to take a 12 hour course in women, peace, and security. Um, that is the only way it's going to ever really be mainstreamed into PME for the teachers to understand it. Um, I would encourage those who are experts in the field to co-author with others. It's a good way to learn about it. I think it's important to network. This is what this, this event is all about. And I've had great conversations with people and I hope to have more because we need to, to make this more than a side thing. We need to have it grow tentacles that, that go into all aspects of the organization. And as was pointed out this morning, DOD, state, USAID, and DHS are the lead implementers in the United States. Well, this is one of the bumper stickers for, the, for, for my course. You can't implement what you don't know about. And my first question to all the audiences I speak to is how many people in the room feel they have a working knowledge of women, peace, and security? And it doesn't matter if it's a room of 10 people, 100 people, or 500 people. And it doesn't matter if it's a military institution, a college, 
whether it's in Addis Ababa, Japan, or Reading, Pennsylvania, it is consistently 10% of the audience. So if you don't know about it, you can't implement it. And you are in charge of implementation. Um, I think, yes, that's my 20 minutes. I will be looking forward to questions. We're gonna take- All right, everyone. Um, so our next presenters are Dr. Susan Yoshihara joining us virtually and Dr. Grace Hoffman, who is here with us. Uh, Dr. Yoshihara and Dr. Hoffman are from the American Council on Women, Peace and Security at a think tank, advancing liberty, opportunity and human dignity for women and girls worldwide. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Vanya. Uh, my name is Grace Hoffman and I'm joined here by my colleague, Dr. Susan Yoshihara. There she is on screen. Um, we're here from the American Council on Women, Peace, and Security, and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Yoshihara to get us started. Thanks, Grace. Great to be back in Pringle. Great to see some former colleagues. I want to first of all thank my friend, uh, Admiral Sho Chatfield, for her leadership during her tenure here. She's off to great things in Europe, um, but she certainly is a, a great supporter, and um, I'm sure that this venue has benefited from it. Also want to thank Syra Yameen, who's taken on the Swanee Hunt chair. And um, from all accounts, just looking at the lineup and, and what we've seen so far, this is just a terrific event. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to my um, co-panelist and former colleague, Joan Johnson Fries, and of course, our esteemed moderator, Vanya. So it's great to be here. And um, American Council on Women, Peace and Security is a relatively new think tank, um, started it about four years ago, and it grew out of policy development, really the need to have in Washington a policy development team that could do both the academic research side and also really bring Congress and the administration together who had a deep experience at the UN doing the international um, WPS work. And I have to say it's... Um, I guess I got my start in 2000 when I was up in Boston working on a PhD and was um, over at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School and Swanee Hunt had started the uh, Women Waging Peace. And I, I think we've come so far from there. So it's great, it's great to see how this is integrated into PME. Um, you can see my screen. So let me just see if I can advance this. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to let Grace Hoffman introduce herself. Um, she's part of the ACWPS team that we've put together. Uh, and this, this team of advisors um, has done four things really in the last few years. And one of them is curriculum development. And part of what we do is mentoring young talent coming up. And so we um, bring in folks from think tanks that are national security oriented and basically bring them on board with um, WPS so that they can be, you know, the next generation of advisors. So um, shortly after we were founded, I got a call from a country intelligence group that had worked with Defense Security Cooperation University for many years on their uh, certification program. If you don't know security cooperation, it fluctuates between 15,000 to 20,000 personnel. We've just started our first civilian run uh, security cooperation office up in Ottawa. And we are under the leadership of uh, Dr. Celeste Vintner at the university who is really bringing us up uh, into um, certification as a graduate school. Uh, it formally did a lot of training. So we are at the intersection of training, certification, and graduate education. It's an exciting place to be. And when they decided to take on WPS, I got a call to bring in a team and design that curriculum. And so what we're gonna do today is just show you how we went into um, a training and PME institution, looked at what their unique needs were uh, and tailored our approach to them. So it was during COVID 2020, got the call in February, 2020. I think we started in August of 2020. So the first thing we did was create micro lessons online, and this was because much of the security cooperation workforce is out on the pointy end. The SCOs are inside embassies all over the world, so they're integrated into country teams, and, um, and they do need to keep up on certification. So we created micro lessons so that we could immediately get them a WPS 101 and a gender analysis 101 uh, for their certification. That's the first thing we did. And the second thing... Um, we did is integrate it, mainstream it into the curriculum. Um, I'm now in the third phase of this 
uh, contract and I am working on a graduate elective. It's going to be a three hour graduate elective, 14 week elective. So um, it's great to be here and great to get ideas from everybody who's teaching. When we uh, integrated, the first thing we did was look at the setup of the school. Now here at Naval War College, you guys have three different areas and three trimesters. We have uh, a core course for SCOs. SCOs, those officers who go to that security cooperation organization in the embassy are the main, the heart sort of, of what we do. Um, they work very closely with the country team, with the country and with the combatant command. So we integrated WPS into that six week flag course. First, we had about uh, three hours including a tabletop exercise. And we tried it a couple of different ways. We started at the very beginning of the course so that they could mainstream WPS throughout. And now we're more in the middle when we're working on capacity building. So we're still working this out and finding the best place for it. But the planners course was really important because really the movement in DOD is to get WPS into planning. It should be in the planning staffs at the, um, at the major staffs, the major commands. It should be in that theater planning. It should be in campaign planning, contingency planning, all kinds of planning. And so I'll let Grace talk about how she did that. But really, we took the planners course and integrated it in there. Um, the MODAs are now called, they're not called MODAs anymore, but we still refer to them as, as MODAs. Um, those defense advisors have been embedded. Those are civilian advisors. We took a little bit of a different approach there, and we brought in panels um, who had been MODIS, because this is kind of an elite group of advisors. And so we thought the best approach was to bring in people who had been there and done that and who could also talk about WPS. Believe me, this is a very niche field, but we've had some fantastic people, had some good results there. Um, international partners. Um, we worked a lot with Congress. Um, I worked with Congress on the law in 2017 and then worked um, again on the strategy and the implementation plans. But Congress, if you look at the NDAAs, is very much interested in measuring what we are doing with international partners. That's the part that's mandated for um, reporting every year. So we looked closely at this international partner course. And one of the main things is the basis of their mandate is very different from ours, right? Ours is the law. Uh, everything we do is the touchstone goes back to the law. And there was a lot to the left of the law. You know, there was the international uh, UN Security Council resolution. Um, there's a lot of international law, some of which the United States is not party to. So we really look at the law as the foundation and what flows from the law. But for international partners, it's different. So we're very uh, careful with international partners. Who's going to be in the room? What country? What treaties have they signed? Did they make reservations to those treaties? I mean, a lot of work goes into teaching, of course, to international partners to be respectful of what their mandate is because we're not imposing the mandate. And of course, we also want to make sure that they understand that this mandate came from uh, countries like Rwanda and um, Bosnia and, and countries that had experienced conflict and really demanded a seat at the table, if you will, and the Security Council gave it. Um, the other piece of what we did is injected WPS into advising by creating scoping tools. So the Defense Institute of Legal Studies here in Newport, where you are, I'm actually in LA, but you're in Newport. Um, they advise nations on uh, things like laws of armed conflict, op law, operational law, human rights law. They have to vet them, do Leahy vetting if we sell arms to them, which is part of security cooperation. So we integrated it two ways, a set of scoping tools that we could pilot in six countries, and then also going through all of their resident courses to inject WPS where necessary. And WPS doesn't belong everywhere. I mean, some places it, it goes neatly and nicely, but let's face it, if it's everywhere, you know, so what, right? So it has to be very relevant. And, and, and so we really looked closely at a few uh, of those and, and Grace can tell you more about that in the Q&A. And lastly, we do have doctrine. Uh, this is a joint publication on uh, WPS. Uh, from published last September. And I recommend it as your go-to source. If you've never done WPS before, pull up this joint pub and it's it's got a nice neat set of tools for you. It's got relevance for you. It's got why women in the military, so the gender integration piece, it's got the security cooperation piece, the planning piece. Um, and so I, I recommend that. Um, so when we were looking at this joint pub to tailor it to security cooperation. Of course, you have to do that in a certain way. So we just took a few. So let's let's look at this um, piece, which is equities. We just pick a few equities like civilian harm mitigation, uh, protection of children, and um, 
encountering and trafficking in persons. And you realize, how do you do that without women in the security sector? And that moves you into a set of capabilities like professionalization, gender integration, um, recruitment and retention. And then how do you recruit and retain women if to the left of that, you don't have some way to keep them safe, right? In countries that might, like ours, have issues with sexual harassment and abuse. So um, by looking first at that end state or outcomes, and then looking at those capabilities or those outputs, that is a way to frame it in some of the classes that we're teaching. From there, let me turn it back over to Grace Hoffman. Great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so I'm going to speak a little bit about how we uh, analyze curriculum, and I'll touch on the hallmarks of our integration, the things that we always try to hit when we're working on these courses. Um, so one of the big things is, of course, as coming in as WPS subject matter experts, uh, it's really important when we're working with faculty and their courses uh, that we develop a really close working relationship with the faculty. Um, and of course, there's many reasons for that. Uh, one of one way that we do that is in many of the courses that we're coming in as SMEs, um, we come in as students first and we take the course um, the whole course, if it's possible, so that we can understand both the student experience and also everything that the faculty has to communicate um, beyond just WPS. What are their overarching goals and how can we uh, insert WPS and help the faculty to understand why WPS is relevant to their those topics that they're touching on? Um, another thing that we try to do when we're developing those relationships, the reason is because we found that Really, at the end of the day, the faculty who own the courses are going to be the best educators of WPS in those courses. Um, so I think, like Joan was saying before about having uh, training and understanding WPS as faculty, uh, once that's done, we found that the faculty, they're the ones who are experts in those topics that they're talking about, and they're able to bring WPS and ask really in-depth questions that a WPS me can't go as deep into, you know, a question about cybersecurity, I can only get the surface, but once we've talk talked with and developed those relationships and that understanding of WPS, um, the faculty can really um, hit the ground running and, and go even beyond uh, what a WPS me can do. Um, and then also, I think that when the faculty is engaged in WPS, it also gives a lot of weight and validity to WPS for the students who are in the room. Um, of course, we bring in um, guest speakers, which are great. Bringing in a WPS SME can be a great way to integrate or begin to integrate WPS into the course. Um, but if the faculty themselves, the instructors who are there every day teaching every other class um, are not touching on WPS, um, or if they do touch on WPS, it really hits um, home a lot stronger for those students um, because they understand that the instructor sees the relevance um, of WPS uh, to everything that they're talking about in the course. Um, other hallmarks that we focus on is we do try to stay aligned with U.S. law for our students, um, but pairing that with an understanding of the international framework and what the international community is doing, um, as well as uh, the differences um, and similarities between partners, that every partner has a different way of implementing it. Um, and that helps students to understand um, all the different perspectives of WPS and also helps them to work closely uh, with the international community and partners. Um, and then of course, important things uh, like all of you will know here at the Naval War College, high standards of scholarship, um, being open to academic debates, um, and also presenting different theories and perspectives that really underpin WPS. Um, is something that we always try to do, and also um, interactive pedagogy. Um, of course, Joan spoke about this in her course. She brings in tabletop exercises. Um, in our courses that aren't WPS focused, uh, we also try to incorporate WPS into those uh, tabletop exercises. Um, and so I'm going to pass it back to Susan, who's going to speak um, a little bit more recommendations specifically for the faculty here. You know, I was going to say, Grace, um, we really do think we were given a mandate actually when we got to DSCU to get we have, when you have a contract you have to get in and get out and deliver products uh, and so we were um, instructed to make sure that we were uh, turning over our product our deliverables to the faculty so that they could continue it um, and I think that's a great market way of doing something that's what OSD wanted us to do that's how they funded the contract which meant we had to create uh, faculty, um, we, we had to intensely train faculty, um, but it took a while, I have to say a couple of years, we did a really terrific 90 minute offsite on WPS 
and had fantastic results. There's a lot of buy-in. And I think it shows how much we've learned about security cooperation as much as they've learned about WPS. Um, and yet it's still something where um, if you're not an expert, you don't feel comfortable. So it's a true partnership. Um, it really is a true partnership. It's a weaning period, if you will. It's not going to happen overnight. But that's why also um, it's important to leverage it what you know. Look, I joined the Navy in 1982. I've been doing WPS for, I don't even want to know how many years that is. I could probably do that in my head, but I was an English major. But I've been doing WPS since before WPS, right? And yet, um, you know, I am not a specialist in the Middle East, for example. And so if you ask me to speak to there, I'd have to bring someone else in. That's perfectly okay. Um, looking at JMO and national security affairs, I taught in the national security affairs department uh, for a few years. Um, my husband taught up at uh, strategy and policy for 10 years. Um, and just looking at the different ways that in, in different objectives of each of your departments, it's easy to see that um, an integration approach works would work beautifully, especially in your exercises. Um, this is a target rich conference for JMO. I mean, if you had, didn't go to the first panel in Spruance, I recommend looking at it online. Um, again, my background is in developing law and policy, working on legislation, hammering out, going into the late night, uh, you know, pitched battles over inches of text. So um, when you talk about how you design and implement policy, uh, that's sort of our sweet spot at the American Council and um, how decisions are made and how that affects and then how you get back into the do loop and refine it. Um, I, I think your faculty is so expert that it would be a great contribution to WPS to get uh, JMO and NSA faculty to become more expert at it, conversant, as Joan said, conversant at it. Um, and I tell this to my faculty and students um, that it's really going to be they who have gone through it, gone out to the pointy end for three years in a scope, and then come back who are going to be improving WPS for the next generation. It really is an iterative um, um, value added. So I'll turn it back over to Grace. Great, so I think um, the next slide when you get it, um, yep. So I'm gonna talk about WPS and historical cases. I know that there are some historians in the room and um, that some courses here deal specifically with historical cases. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this is I'm a historian. I come, I received my PhD in history from Trinity College Dublin, where I studied rebellion and conflict in an Irish and British Empire context. Uh, so I came from that context and then jumped into the WPS world. Um, and so just to speak to the historians in the room, the skills that we have as historians um, really allow you to learn WPS. I know sometimes we talk about the complexities and nuances of WPS, um, but of course you all know that um, history has many nuances and compl complexities as well. Um, so what I wanted to kind of focus on is that WPS can benefit our historical cases and our understandings of historical cases, and also history can really benefit WPS. Um, so as historians, of course, we're always after new knowledge. We wanna understand historical cases. We wanna ask new questions. Uh, new questions always lead to new knowledge and new ways of thinking about historical case. So when you're engaging with WPS and bringing it to courses with historical cases, think of it from the perspective that this is really gonna help you to get at that new knowledge uh, that we're always seeking as historians. Um, and that really is just looking at WPS, understanding it, having an understanding of what WPS is, and then forming questions yourselves. Um, and bringing that to those historical cases. And I think that's uh, been an encouraging thought for me as I try to see how WPS and history can uh, relate to one another in my own research. Um, and that WPS really opens a new area of questions that maybe we just weren't thinking of um, when looking at a historical case. On the other side, of course, history can really benefit WPS. Um, of course, history and historians have very robust academic, uh, rigorous academic skills, um, really focused on clear sources and evidence. And they're also really aware of nuances uh, that sometimes discipl other disciplines make broad claims and historians are the ones that come into the room and go, oh, it wasn't the case uh, in this specific instance that we can find evidence for. Um, but it's also a way of putting this into perspective um, WPS, while it's new in the, the way that we understand it, came in 2000 at the UN Security Council. The US has a law in 2017. 
Uh, the concepts and principles of WPS are not new and they're not novel, and we can find evidence of this going back centuries. Um, and so I think historians can, if they start to engage with WPS, it's going to really make WPS more robust and also understanding uh, that that this isn't new and that's a good thing uh, because we can really learn. Uh, there's much more to learn from uh, than just contemporary modern examples. Um, one example of that uh, really is a historical case that I've been looking at um, in post-World uh, War II Japan during the Allied occupation um, that was led by General Douglas MacArthur. I'm writing a chapter that's going to be part of an edited volume coming out in a little bit. Um, but what I found is that uh, these WPS principles, as we understand them today, and as they wouldn't have um, talked about it, of course, in 1950 Japan, um, but they were present. And General MacArthur actually um, recognized this in some capacity. Of course, we can get into the nuances later if we want to get into Q&A about this. Um, but MacArthur, from the very beginning, when he was going into Japan and wanted to establish a free democracy and form a strong alliance, um, which today we know is one of, if not the strongest alliance uh, with the United States. Um, one of the first things he wrote down was that women need to be given the right to vote and they need to be enfranchised in the constitution. And I think that's really helpful for us uh, looking at a case like that because MacArthur was a strategist. He wasn't a WPS person by any means. Um, and so we can look at a historical case and see that WPS was recognized um, as a strategic advantage, um, not just as something that we feel like we have to do because it's a good thing. Um, I will stop there for now. Um, I just put up a few other topics um, that I think lend themselves easy, easily to being uh, having WPS included in them. So if any of your historical cases might touch on this, of course, this isn't um, an extensive list, but um, just to get your brains thinking. Um, and I will leave it there and thank you all so much and pass it to Susan for closing remarks. Yeah, I've wanted to first of all commend uh, Grace for being our uh, historian on this book project that I'm leading. It's, um, it really does look, it's uh, heterodox in its approach on, on theory because really there is no one theory that underpins WPS. You know, as Joan said, uh, at Naval War College, you look at different theories that underpin foreign policy. Um, but when you are a you know, advising policymakers and trying to translate a, a theory into uh, an idea of change in foreign policy, you really do have to connect it to realpolitik. You do have to connect it to national security priorities. And what we're doing it in this um, project, this research project, is tying it to not theory, but to principles, principles of American foreign policy, like a strong military as the foundation of statecraft like liberty as one of the chief values that the United States has always promoted, uh, liberty and equality of opportunity, for example. WPS gives us, um, as a research idea, a niche uh, way to test democracy promote, uh, promotion and great power competition, right? Um, certainly there are volumes coming out about ideas in great power competition. Uh, certainly with China, we haven't exploited ideas. They certainly do exploit ideas, right? So, um, but WPS offers that kind of rich case uh, study and case studies, which this volume has, um, on how those values can work one way or another. And when you look at security cooperation, look, as Joan said, it's peanuts, it's budget dust. When you look at $6 million for WPS activities in, in FY22, that doesn't seem like much. But a $300,000 WPS activity in a nation where you're spending billions on foreign military sales can make a difference. And one of the things we do um, in security cooperation is am &E or um, the measuring and evaluation piece of it, um, which again is, is something that we're developing. But in WPS, we ask the question, what would happen to this activity, whether it's border control or F-16s to do whatever, whatever, whatever your activity is, what would happen to that major activity if you didn't do gender? If you did not look at women at all, if you did look at the gender issue, what would the risk be to that larger activity? And I think that's one way of looking at the value of WPS in a very small way. Um, and, and yet that's the beauty of teaching in PME, right? This is not theory, right? We, we have to make it relevant. But at the same time, that relevance adds value right back into WPS. 
So it's just been a real pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure working in this space and being part of the WPS community. And we're looking forward to your questions.